I do some consulting work on the American feeling Indian in the room was You don't ever say to her that what about the Chicago incident? We're trying to back over. doing an autism. According to our next guest, there is a cost to caring. Charles Figley has spent more than 35 years studying trauma and its effects on both victims and caregivers. His work has led to innovations in psychology, psychiatry, and social work. Figley is a professor and distinguished chair in disaster mental health at Tulane University. A graduate of Penn State, he was named a Lifetime Alumni Fellow in 2004, the highest university honor presented to graduates. We'll talk with him about the field of traumatology, about those who treat the traumatized, and about his personal experiences with compassion fatigue. Here's our conversation with Charles Figley. Charles Figley, welcome to the conversation. Thank you. Unfortunately, there is no shortage of trauma or suffering in the world, and, and so I want to know a little bit about this field you're in, okay. traumatology. What okay. is it? Well, it's a study of trauma, essentially. It's a study and treatment of trauma. It started in medicine and expanded very rapidly when post-traumatic stress disorder was uh, initiated in the 1980s. But it's understanding the immediate and long-term psychosocial, medical, emotional, physiological uh, consequences of trauma and then, you know, trying to prevent it, if, if possible, at least the damage, and, uh, and try to enable people to recover whatever... Uh, damage or, or needs they have. Give us a definition of post-traumatic stress disorder. It's something that we associate with uh, uh, veterans, yes. war veterans, yes. and, and yet it really I encompasses mm -hmm. all kinds of trauma and all kinds of uh, victims. Well, technically, it's, it's an anxiety disorder. Uh, mentioned in 1980, it, uh, it was born. Um, officially. Was, officially. Because you write in your book that Charles Dickens suffered what was probably post-traumatic stress disorder. Yes, uh, there's a lot of evidence to indicate that, at least for a short amount of time, that Ronald Reagan experienced that after he was shot. But it's, it's an anxiety disorder that's it's really associated with uh, a, an upsetting, unusual, shocking event or series of events that can last just a second or two, believe it or not, <laughs> or can last years and years. Uh, in the case, for example, of domestic violence, and leaves the person, um, what, uh, broken. You say we become prisoners of yes. our memories, and, and the way to get over post-traumatic stress disorder is, uh, the way to be set free is to master those memories. Yes. How do you do that? Yes, that's the trauma paradox. Uh, I think that if, if we are able to do that, we wouldn't have uh, a trauma, we wouldn't have PTSD, et cetera. So there is a certain degree of motivation to get over it. But the difficulty is that as we address those questions, it requires us to go back <laughs> to the event. And when we go back to the event, we literally feel ourselves filling up with the emotional and physiological reactions. And, but then when we shut it out, it goes away. So there is a natural tendency to avoid <laughs> thinking about, talking about uh, the past in order to not feel bad. But un inevitably, though, we do. Actually, you put it into a, a, a nice little uh, adage, in order to heal, you have to feel. Yes. Your colleague, uh, Frank Ockberg, yes. uh, talked about going to Johns Hopkins University and a, a surgeon there saying to him, I can teach you in seven days how to remove a lung, <laughs> but it will take me seven years to teach you when to remove a lung, <laughs> which, which brings me to uh, those on the front lines dealing with people who have suffered some trauma. How do you know where to take them, how far to push them to help them overcome a post-traumatic stress disorder? Lots of experience. I testify in court uh, not a lot, maybe a couple times a year. and. In most cases, when I'm asked to testify, it's as an expert witness based on 30 to 40 years of experience, which is hard to replicate. And that's really what's required, really. Um, those that start their career uh, trying to help combat veterans, for example, unless they're one themselves, find it impossible. Uh, because you have to have a context, you have to have some mm, theory, uh, a particular approach that that is helpful, useful, you feel comfortable with it. 
And then with the timing issue, uh, that's one of the most important things because if a client has figured out those questions of what happened, why did it happen, and all that, and then able to uh, uh, relate that to the counselor, that indicates that they're ready. So it takes a lot of training, a lot of supervision, a lot of experience. But luckily, there, we've come a long way since 1980 when PTSD, for example, was... First uh, made it into the DSM-3. Yes, three. yeah. Uh, we've come a long way in terms of our sophistication in being able to, first of all, even assess and accurately diagnose. And then we know about traumatic, uh, in, uh, traumatic injuries and the kinds of specific injuries uh, that are associated with it uh, in order to a direction to go in. For example, someone who survived a traumatic event that's primarily a grief injury is quite different than a meaning uh, injury or a uh, or a um, only a trauma injury or just fatigue. I wanted to talk a little bit about the causes of trauma because yeah. earlier I said that uh, we think of trauma as, or PTSD as something that happens to combat soldiers. Right. But trauma can happen to anyone and PTSD can happen to anyone. Yes. What are sources of PTSD? It runs the whole gamut. Uh, a lot of people think you, you have to have these major traumatic events, but not necessarily. There are children who are traumatized by hearing their parents fighting. Uh, and then filling in the blank in that regard. Uh, auto accidents, uh, any time in which there is a, uh, a dissociative experience, in which it's surreal, uh, any time in which you thought you were going to die and you behaved in that way and it lasted more than a few days, uh, any time in which there is a verbal altercation that could lead to your feeling unsafe could potentially uh, be a traumatic uh, injury, uh, all the way to, you know, again, surviving all, any and all kinds of disasters and, and, uh, and, uh, and human-caused disasters. But uh, therapists can get uh, traumatized easily, uh, not just in terms of compassion fatigue, but if they're, the clients they're working with attempt to attack them. I mean, it's uh, fairly common. There, there's even a difference, you say, uh, whether the trauma was the result of a natural disaster, for example, a flood or a hurricane, yes. versus a rape or, or a robbery or mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Yes. Yes, it makes all the difference in the world if the event could have been prevented. Now, sometimes, like with Katrina uh, in New Orleans that I'm very familiar with, had the levees <laughs> held we would have had far less, I would say probably 90% less uh, problems. But it was a human error that enabled the federal levy system to be damaged. So a lot of people think, uh, oh, you're a Katrina survivor. It's not the surviving the winds and the rain. It's really surviving the flooding and the aftermath. When it's man, human assisted, uh, it's far more difficult because you're dealing with the trauma, definitely. But then there's, there are people that need to be held accountable in order to prevent this from happening again. There's a sense of social justice that's needed. So it's very difficult. But even with, uh, in which it's a, a traumatic event that only one person has experienced, it, that's also difficult because there's no one else really to compare notes with to uh, serve as a, 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 a fellow survivor in effect. So even if it's, even it's human caused or if it's natural, uh, then that's a, a big problem, too. There's a stigma attached to almost anything that's psychological in nature. Uh, you have a psychological disorder, and it's treated one way. You have a physical disorder, and we treat it in an entirely different way. Uh, but I'm wondering what your uh, group of traumatologists is doing to destigmatize PTSD. Well, I... And, uh, I in 1985, when my, after my daughter's second child was born, I established the Society for Traumatic Stress Studies. Uh, it's now called the International Society, even though it was international at the time. But if you go to the ISTSS.org or if you go to GreenCross.org, uh, Division 56 within the American Psychological Association, uh, Division on Trauma Psychology, 
all of them are doing exceptionally good jobs of educating the general public as well as their own as their colleagues. The National Center for PTSD is extraordinarily helpful and useful. It's part of the VA uh, Veterans Administration system. But it's the notion of that it could happen to anyone else, first of all. Uh, it is a very normal and natural uh, reaction that if you look at PTSD, that's fairly uncommon. Um, but uh, being traumatized and having traumatic stress reactions is extraordinarily common. How did you get into all of this? And I, I, <laughs> I ask that because I know you were a Vietnam veteran, mm -hmm. a Marine. Yeah. Uh, uh, did that have some influence on your interest in trauma? The only interest, actually. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I uh, participate when I was at Penn State. I discovered the Vietnam Veterans Against the War, and that's how I felt, but I really didn't know how to express it. Uh, I was on college campuses here at Penn State. There really wasn't all that much anti-war movement even here. Uh, so it was frustrating. So when I learned that uh, there was going to be a demonstration in Washington in which real war veterans were there and would throw back the medals that they earned, on the Capitol steps in protest, I had to go. Well, in the process of doing that and sort of putting aside the politics of it, uh, I spent a lot of time talking to a, a lot of uh, guys, mostly, a couple of nurses that were there who saw more blood than anybody. But um, it, it struck me, I guess, on, on a couple of levels. One is I discovered how lucky I was. I was happily married. I had a fellowship at Penn State. I was going to... Uh, soon, uh, in August, I would graduate and, and the part of the job was to go and, and get a university position and teach uh, in the area of, of human development, human sexuality. So that was tremendous, but all these men, and, and mostly men, uh, were in serial monogamy, they were divorced, uh, they were substance abuse issues, violence and anger issues, and I shifted uh, my attention from just being a scholar, which I couldn't wait to do, I loved research, into a social activist without any kind of training or any kind of, uh, of competence and background in that area. So I fairly quickly discovered that I was not very good at being a demonstrator. I, <laughs> I just couldn't get to places on time and uh, I didn't want to be arrested and, you know, there's, there's a number of things. Uh, Self-preservation type things. Maybe. Yeah, I mean, I was <laughs> hopeless. I mean, I... I guess I just didn't feel strong enough to go to jail, uh, even though you got right out, they say. But what I knew I was pretty good at was research. So I started interviewing these guys. And so when you look at a, a Vietnam veteran, for example, who is suffering from PTSD 20, 30 years mm -hmm. out, we look at PTSD as something that's intractable, and that mm -hmm. yet you and Tony Robbins and all kinds of people say, Everyone can recover from PTSD. Yes. yes. And you believe that? Oh, without a doubt. I mean, there, well, first of all, a lot of people don't understand this. I have never, I have never seen a case of PTSD without another disorder. <laughs> so PTSD and, and uh, uh, a phobia, uh, PTSD and uh, depression, and especially PTSD and substance abuse, because that's a way of self-soothing to try to calm themselves down. So. If we're able to master both the disorders, then absolutely no problem whatsoever. And I'm also saying that in most cases, there is uh, that drugs hurt rather than help. Drugs are effective initially, and I'm not talking about illegal drugs, I'm talking about illegal drugs too, but in, in terms of prescription drugs, uh, you, you want to make that a, a very uh, minimal, very uh, as, as much as you can uh, with proper and effective uh, but that's not what's happening. And that's not what's happening. A lot of the work that you're doing is on uh, working with the, the trauma workers. And, mm -hmm. and when we say trauma workers, we're not just talking about first responders. Mm -hmm. First of all, who are America's trauma workers? Well, there are there are certainly first responders or anyone who responds to a trauma either directly or indirectly. Directly to the extent of uh, firefighters, police officers, uh, um, disaster workers but also indirectly, those who are uh, psychotherapists, nurses, um, rehab uh, counselors, uh, drug and alcohol abuse counselors, really anyone who, family members uh, who, um, who deal with people who've been traumatized. 
And, and you say a lot of people who gravitate to those things are, are people who are sensitive to begin with, uh, and that sensitivity is both a, a curse and a blessing, yes. uh, and that there is a cost to caring. Yes. Uh, you came up with a term called compassion fatigue. Yes. Uh, explain what that is. Well, compassion fatigue, in, in some ways like PTSD, is the result of overexposure, at least for that particular person, of uh, horrible, sad, or upsetting events. And that you absorb that in an effort to try to help the person. And uh, compassion fatigue, first there is a compassion stress. So it's the demand to be compassionate with people that you try to help and understand by seeing the world from their perspective, of offering uh, empathic uh, an empathic response to enable them to go deeper and to, to share that experience. Well, in the process of doing that, you're let into their world. You feel their pain. You feel their pain, yeah. And, and it's, and obviously the people who, who succeed in being able to be therapists need to have a certain level of compassion and, and, uh, and empathy. It, you, you really can't do the work unless you have that. But in the process, though, yeah, they, they are less able to compartmentalize as quickly as they need to. They're less able to sort of slough it off and let it go. And actually, you recognized it in yourself. You yes. yourself suffered from it. Yes. After I graduated with my Ph.D., I went to Purdue University. And it was then the first opportunity, really, I could focus on this area in remembering my experiences in Washington, D.C. in, in uh, 1971 and meeting all these vets. I had started a vet center when I was at, uh, I'm sorry, not a vet center, but a vets group when I was at Bowling Green State University in between my masters and Ph.D. So we went, when I went to Purdue, uh, I wanted to go deeper, not only in reaching out to veterans that are on campus, but starting some research. And among the things that I did was interview um, a group of veterans who had filled out some questionnaires a million years ago, much earlier, maybe six, seven years earlier, and began to interview them, <clears throat> most often uh, in their own home, <clears throat> and most often in their families, their parents' home. I was on a mission, and the mission was to explain, and to first of all, try to understand why these men did not get over, like I did in many ways, their war experiences, and to develop a theoretical model that could be tested, which I did. But in the, so in the process, I wanted to hold on to those memories. I wanted to hold on to those experiences and took as many notes as I could. Well, I learned from my doctoral students uh, later <laughs> that uh, they could tell that I had been to East St. Louis because I... Because of your demeanor. Yeah, I was uh, not as um, funny, uh, not as... Uh, kind. You lost uh, your sense of humor? Lost my sense of humor, yeah. And um, so it was uh, that experience. It wasn't so much remembering my own traumatic experiences, because I didn't really think I had that many. I still don't. But it was really the memories of other people. I, I, I'm sure my uh, first marriage ended as a result of this, because I was angry a lot. And uh, and gradually, I was able to achieve my first book in 1978, Stress Disorders Among Vietnam Veterans, helped a lot because it was a, it was a, it was a scratch, the itch that I scratched. Then the second book on um, Strangers at Home, Vietnam Veterans Since the War, that really sealed it for me. And uh, I was much, much better as a result of that. In a way, you worked through your issues by writing them. I did. And it's interesting because I, I took notes uh, in terms of the interviews. And it was very interesting because that in and of itself, in terms of narrative therapy and, and writing therapy and all that sort of thing, is therapeutic. I didn't know it at the time. But it really hit me when I noticed in about 1980 or so that a lot of, of uh, guys veterans had left the movement. They were not counselors anymore, social workers in particular. There were several suicides, for example. So I said, ooh, wait a second. What we have is a second wave of trauma, and that is those of us who knew what the problems were, knew we could help these men and women, but yet were being traumatized in the process. 
So secondary post-traumatic stress disorder. Yeah, secondary traumatic stress reactions, secondary traumatic stress disorder. So I started just reaching out to my colleagues in the various professions and asked, you know, has something like this happened to you? Lo and behold, it has. So I published the uh, 1995 book. Uh, Compassion fatigue as a result. And part of the reason compassion fatigue is, is such an important issue is those in the helping professions, if they enter this compassion fatigue mm -hmm. and it can devolve into burnout, yes. uh, burnout really is bad for everyone. It's bad for everyone because it's a career killer. Uh, we developed this measure that would identify your risk of developing burnout. Uh, uh, secondary trauma, well, burnout and secondary trauma primarily. And we figured that if you have burnout, then you need to change jobs, <laughs> definitely. If you have secondary trauma or compassion fatigue, there's ways of helping you, of compartmentalizing, of stress management, of, of self-awareness. There's all kinds of strategies. So it's important for us to know, so in other words, to not change jobs, but rather to work through this issue because you probably uh, enjoy the work. I developed a theoretical model like I did in trying to understand combat veterans. And you're able to see very clearly, if you look at the research uh, and you superimpose it on this model, you can see very, very clearly that if you are someone who is extraordinarily compassionate, you're more at risk. If you uh, don't uh, watch your boundaries, you're at risk. If you don't um, uh, take vacations, take breaks. Uh, s if self-care isn't as important as client care, you have troubles. Mm -hmm. And for most people, even those who've had very difficult cases of compassion fatigue, they spring back. Because a lot of it is that they can't do anything. You know, they wish they could help, and they can't. And so it's the notion of learning that. When we talked about compassion fatigue, and, and, and I, I'm wondering if there is such a thing as institutional compassion fatigue mm -hmm. as something that perhaps the entire Penn State community has suffered from. Yes, that's why I'm here. Um, I was delighted to be able to have the opportunity to come here because, um, I mean, for one of the reasons, one of the reasons why I selected Penn State in part was because of uh, Joe Paterno <sighs> and the integrity and, um, and focus on the student athlete with the student coming first rather than athlete student. And um, I knew it would be a place of, um, of, of pride and nurturance and that's what I found. But uh, you feel this deeply. Yeah, yeah. Because I, I know how horrible it is for these children, but I also know how horrible it is for good people to be associated with thinking that they had anything to do with that. And um, I just, my heart goes out to all of you because I, you know, I can go through my life and, and I have, you know, my, my uh, degrees on the wall. But um, I don't have to uh, be uh, subjected um, to this sad tragedy here, as all of you have, and um, and I'm and I care about deeply uh, Graham Spanier. He he's a friend. He was a former professor of mine, and it's just heartbreaking to see how he's been treated. Do you have advice for for any of us, all of us, Graham Spanier? I, I, this too will pass. Um, my sense, though, just being candid, and I didn't say this today, I think it's important for Penn State and all of the community to grapple with this a bit more to the extent of what happened and, and why it happened, and to try to fix that as quickly as possible, and why people behaved the way they did at the time and try to deconstruct that, to try to get at the truth, because I don't think we have the truth yet. And that's the lovely thing about trauma. There is this accounting. Uh, and, and when we do that, there will be a natural purging and that the, the new Penn State, uh, the, the post-tragedy Penn State will emerge much more quickly and, and clearly. You've been at this, uh, in this field of traumatology for 35 plus mm -hmm. years now. Right. Uh, what more needs to be done? You've obviously made lots of progress, mm -hmm. but for you, what one or two things need to happen? 
Well, I think we need to focus on the traumatic injury rather than the disorder. By the time we focus on the disorder, it's too late. You want to change actually the name from post-traumatic stress disorder to post-traumatic stress injury. Yes, but I understand that uh, for practitioners and for various other reasons, they're, they probably need the concept of post-traumatic stress disorder. But when you think of it, it's a very tiny percentage of those people who are traumatized or who have uh, experienced a traumatic injury. So we need to new, do a much better job of seeing uh, trauma in a in a spectrum of from just horrible and no one could ever get over it to relatively minimal. And then we also need a spectrum of reactions so that we can really focus our attention on those that have the disorder to make sure that they recover but not avoid the others because they certainly need help. Uh, education, uh, psychosocial education about, you know, the natural process of consequences, the five victim questions. There's lots of things that we can do. But those that are on the other spectrum, those folks probably would be great role models, great examples of someone who pretty survived. much had the same, yeah, who survived and, and are thriving now. So that's what I would hope that we focus on the positive and the consequences of that. All right, Charles Figley, thank you so much for talking You're with welcome. us. welcome. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Charles Figley. Comcast subscribers can watch this program anytime on Penn State On Demand. Find out how through our website, conversations.psu.edu, where you'll also find additional video from this interview. I'm Patty Satalia. We hope you'll join us for our next conversation from Penn State. Production funding provided in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by viewers like you. Thank you. This has been a production of WPSU.